Good evening. It's wonderful to be back with you once again, isn't it, Ronnie? Yes, indeed it is. And in a packed programme tonight, we shall be showing you an astonishingly frank interview with the Strathclyde mother-to-be, Flora McDingle, who claims she was put in the pudding club by artificial insemolina. <laughs> I'll be talking to a man who was late for his work this morning. He overslept because the football match he was dreaming about went into extra time. <laughs> but first, the news. Britain's decathlon squad was told today that frequent sexual indulgence reduces their chances of success. Daily Thompson will henceforth be known as Twice Nightly Thompson. <laughs> Norbert Tush was charged at Bridlington Town Hall today under the Leaseholders Act of willful misuse of home improvement grant. He used it to send his mother-in-law to Australia. <laughs> And at Romford Magistrates Court today, a £50 fine was imposed on the driver of an ice cream van for failing to stop when the lights were on strawberry. <laughs> a disappointing end this afternoon to Wyndham Ponsonby's heroic one-man walk across the roof of the world. He fell down the chimney. <laughs> London gangland's farewell to gambling den operator Nifter Nugent was cut short today when the police showed up and his ashes immediately scattered themselves. <laughs> and there's sensational news from Heathrow Airport. Mr. Chamberlain's luggage has just got back from Munich. <laughs> we now a sketch in which Mr. Ronnie Corbett plays the part of a KGB mole who is positively vetted by MI5 and then doctored by the RSPCA. <laughs> Dearly beloved, we are gathered here in the sight of God and in the face of this congregation to join together this man and this woman in Holy Gladys. What do you mean, Holy Gladys? What do you mean, Holy Gladys? I'm awfully sorry. It is Gladys, isn't it? It's Gladys Brocklebank, isn't it? Hello, Henry. Hello, Henry. <laughs> Say hello, Henry. I didn't I didn't know you were going to do the service. Oh, yes. I'm, I'm just standing in, you see. Standing in what, may I ask? Oh, don't make a fuss. As a matter of fact, Gladys and I used to walk out together. Oh, did you? Well, if you don't get on with the service, mate, you and I'll be walking out together. <laughs> you should get one right in the vestry. Now, carry on with it, please. If any of you know cause or just impediment why these two persons should not be joined together in holy matrimony, ye do now declare it, or else, hereafter, forever, hold thy peace. But it's quiet, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> why don't you carry on, in all right? I'm waiting. Someone in the congregation might have an impediment. <laughs> Look, mate, my Uncle George is sitting back in the third row. He's got a terrible stutter. <laughs> and a double hernia. But what difference does that make the price of tomatoes? <laughs> They're ever so high at the moment. What? <laughs> Look, Glad, will you please keep out of this? This is strictly between the Randy Rev and me. <laughs> oh, dear, talk to her in that manner. You're not fit to kiss the hem of her bridal gown or any other part of her. <laughs> her bridal gown, I mean. You never mind where I'm going to kiss her. It's your job to make it legal. Now, will you kindly get on with the verbals, Vicar, please? If you will bear with me for just a moment, there might be a slight delay. There is, in fact, an impediment. What are you talking about, mate? Someone disapproves of this union. I'm not even a member of the union. <laughs> This marriage. Who's that, then? Me. Me. You're off your trolley, Vicar. Seven years ago, Gladys swore to be faithful to me eternally. Is this so, Gladys? No, of course not. There you are, Vicar, on your bike. <laughs> oh, oh, what's this, then? What's this? Look. There you are. What's that? Scotch mist? What does it say there? Henry and Gladys and a little rat standing in a bowl of spaghetti. A little rat standing in a bowl of spaghetti? Those are the twin serpents of true love surmounted by the lion of virtue. Look, mate, I've got a tattoo round my belly button that says I love Burton best. What does that make me, Elizabeth Taylor? <laughs> Have you forgotten, Gladys? Have you forgotten what we meant to each other? That wonderful golden fortnight in Lytham St Anne's? Or the time when we stole away from the Ken Dodd concert at 20 past one? <laughs> and we went on that moonlight pedalo trip on the ship canal? Henry, please, not the ship canal. Oh, it's like that, is it? Listen, Gladys, did you give yourself to him, then? No, I didn't. Well, did you lend yourself to him? <laughs> Grimshaw, do you want to marry me or not? What do you think? Of course I do. I spent 75 quid in once on this outfit. Of course I do. <laughs> marry me. I have a handsome stipend. I bet you have all covered in tattoos and all. Right? <laughs> Forget the pedalos, dear. After this bum fight, we shall be off to Venice. We'll be being serenaded by dagos in dongolas. <laughs> marry me, please. My flesh yearns for you. Well, so does mine. So does mine. I bet my flesh yearns twice as much as yours does. <laughs> You've got twice as much flesh as me, haven't you? <laughs> Gladys, we could build utopia together, you and I. Listen, we've already built a maze, and we've got planning permission for the garage and everything. <laughs> Take your filthy hands off her spotless white bridal gown. Well, they're not ought to be white anyway, not after Lytham's in hands, are they? <laughs> he insulted me. Well, be fair, he does have a point, doesn't he, Gladys? What? I mean, now, listen, well, the ship could... Careful, you'll get one on the cassock, you know that. <laughs> oh, I'm fed up with a pair of you. I'm going to marry Purse. Purse? The best man? Well, he's certainly better than you two. Come on, Purse. <laughs> well, that is nice, isn't it? 
a couple of nice tickets to Venice right up the swan. You know, I've never been to Venice. No? There you are, Rev. Have them on me. Oh, I see. That's awfully sweet of you. No, I've been to Paris three times and Rome twice and once to Vienna and to Nice. Oh, and a long weekend in Bogda. My goodness, it was long, too. But I, I always like the champagne on the wedding night, you see. What do you mean? Well, a lot of people part at the altar. They always give me the honeymoon tickets. <laughs> Care to come with me? What? Me? Come with you? Yes, why not? They say there's a wonderful little flea market on the Rialto. Well, why not? After all, I paid for them, didn't I? Yes. You're on, Vic. You're oh. on. Certainly. Will you want to go home and change? Oh, yes. I've got a lovely little girl in the way out. <laughs> Please welcome our guest this week, Elaine Page. From almost every point of view I don't need him any longer Once again I'm going through All the moves I've made before Till it comes to leaving Till it comes George, uh, uh, you didn't have any uh, baked bean and marmite, so I got you uh, some shrimp and bob roll. Oh. <laughs> so, your Lil's having a night out tonight, is she? Yeah, she's gone to the dogs. Yeah, well, we know that, but she's having a night out. <laughs> no, I mean, she's gone down the racetrack with your Eid, hasn't she? You know, they've gone dog racing for the oh, night. Oh, that's right. They'll probably lose all their money gambling, finish up paralytic as pigs. <laughs> They get picked up by a couple of drunks, probably finish up being ravaged at some all-night orgy at Peckham. <laughs> Still, it keeps them out of mischief, doesn't it? <laughs> Talking of mischief, by the way, far be it from me, Sid, to pry into your sexual pro cavities. <laughs> but I couldn't help noticing, ever since you come in here, you've been wearing a frilly black garter around the sleeve of your donkey jacket. <laughs> Which, if my memory serves me correct, is not your usual modus operandi, is it? Now, where well, is an explanation of that, George? Oh, I should jolly well hope so. <laughs> you remember the other weekend, you and I went up the West End, don't we? Yeah. And we ended up about two in the morning in that draughty little strip club. Oh, yeah, the air on the G-string, yeah, I remember. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, as I recall, that night we had quite a few. As a matter of fact, I can't remember yeah. rightly what happened. Anyway, the other day, there I was at home, you see. Yeah. Lil, mind her own business, going through my pockets. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> she found this black garter, you see. Well, naturally, I had my wits about me, didn't I? So I spruced her along that it was a black 
armband I bought, you see, in mourning for my Uncle Cedric, who as luck would have it, had dropped dead the day before. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was lucky, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Very fortuitous. Yeah, not, of course, quite so lucky for Uncle Cedric, no, was <laughs> <laughs> And then, of course, being very, uh, you know, uh, What's the name, you know, what, what's that word, you know, means, you know, they believe anything you say? Thick. Yeah. <laughs> thick. Yeah, 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 I suppose that's right, thick, yeah. Lil, yeah, yeah. she swallowed it all, you see, of course. Yeah. Of course, I've still got to wear this for a few days, otherwise you get very suspicious. Oh, yeah, good job she didn't find that bra in your other pocket, then, wouldn't it? <laughs> Otherwise, you'd be walking around with red satin earmuffs, wouldn't you? <laughs> little holes to poke your earlobes through. <laughs> yeah. Here, listen, how old was Uncle Cedric when he kicked it then? Well, uh, the wrong side of 60. What's that? 94. <laughs> Mind you, for the last four months, he'd been shacked up with a young bird of 25. Shacked up? Yeah. You're a 20. I think he was shacked out, wasn't he? <laughs> you see, he never had kids of his own. He wanted to carry on the family strain. Well, it would have been a strain, yeah. <laughs> Will he die off terminal X to see a woman? <laughs> It's funny talking about life and death. You know, I often sit here and I wonder, I wonder, why are we here? Well, the beer's cheaper for one. <laughs> I don't mean here, I don't mean here. Oh, sitting here in the merry thatcher having a pint. No, I'm talking about the answer to the external riddle. Why do any of us exist? Well, it's something to do, isn't it? <laughs> and furthermore, what happens afterwards? Now, I was watching this programme the other night on ITV and there was a geezer on there what reckoned that it is possible that there is intelligent life on the other side. What, you mean on Channel 4, you mean? <laughs> Channel 4? No. no, be realistic, Sid, for God's sake. <laughs> He reckoned that snuffing it is not the be-all and end-all of everything, you see. Oh. Yeah, in fact, you and I could very well finish up in hell. No. Yep. Oh, dear. Hell, what do you suppose... What do you suppose hell's like, George? I mean, just suppose... Not a very nice place, I suppose. Well, of course it ain't a very nice place, is it? Otherwise it wouldn't be hell, would it? No, no. It must be a terrible place. I always imagine it's some vast, bottomless, burning pit where everyone's all chained up, you know, yeah. and forced to eat shrimp and Bob Real crisps, right? <laughs> <laughs> bit like East Croyd. <laughs> Listen, you suppose my Uncle Cedric, then, has ended up in hell, would you think? No, no, no. it's my theory. But yeah. even now, he's been reincarnated. Reincarnated? What do you mean that? Really? Well, reincarnated, you know, when you come back to something else. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. If I had to come back to something else, you know, I was thinking, if I had to come back to something else, I would come back as an hyena. <laughs> What'd you come back as a hyena for, then? Well, if you come back as a hyena, you're laughing, aren't you? <laughs> You've got all that foreign sunshine, no food to hunt for for yourself. All your food is provided for you by lions. By lions? Yeah. What, you mean lions' corner has, isn't it? Not that sort of food. It's deer. Deer. Well, it's not all that deer in lions' corner. <laughs> the big cats, you see, oh. the big cats, they go out and hunt all the food that the hyenas scavenge off. Oh, it must be a great life. Oh, no, if I come back as anything, I think I'd come back as a giraffe. A giraffe? Why? Well, I wouldn't want to be a hyena, not with my feet, for a start, would Well, I? you wouldn't have your feet, would you? You'd have the hyena's feet, would you? You wouldn't be tramping about through the tropical undergrowth wearing two pairs of black blokes and a set of odour eaters, would you? You'd have, you'd have the hyena's feet, wouldn't you? Well, yeah, but I still think, really, basically, overall, taking an average, if I were to come back, I'd sooner be a giraffe. Well, what is this about a giraffe? Why a giraffe? Well, it stopped you picking your nose so much, wouldn't it? <laughs> Listen, now, let's talk about this reincarnation. If my Lil were to be reincarnated, yeah. what do you suppose she's come back as? Well, great white whale, I think. <laughs> yeah, I suppose she'd be all that whalebone corset, all that, yeah, all yeah. that blubber and everything. Yeah. She's got a head start, hasn't she? She certainly has, yeah. <laughs> she nearly got harpooned when you took her paddling at Clacton, actually. <laughs> yeah, I'm mean, exactly time, it's two o'clock. I've got to be getting out of here. Here, yeah, I must put my armband on now. My black armband, here it is. What, you going to a funeral and all, then? No, I'm going to watch Chelsea play at home. <laughs> Good evening. I'm the Minister of Cuts. I represent the National Institute of Cutting Known Economic Resources, Double Urgent, or knickers to you. <laughs> now, what does all this mean? Well, firstly, we've cut the armed services. And here's the new streamlined army brigade. Two men, one to fire the gun, and the other to ask for the bullet back. <laughs> Lance Corporal Hackett has reported sick. What's more, we're putting the army on a one-day week, so unless the Russians attack on a Monday, we'll be closed. <laughs> now, the Navy will remain on at full strength, but we will be using a cheaper, cheaper missile launcher from Scotland. <laughs> yes, members of the RAF will still be up there flying, although a much greater degree of skill will be demanded of them, as there won't be any aeroplanes. <laughs> now, what is wrong with this picture? <laughs> 
Yes, you spotted it. It's not the real queen. As an economy, many famous people are being replaced by robots. And here is a bionic Clement Freud. It doesn't move, but it's indistinguishable from the real thing. We already have four Michael Heseltines sitting on various committees. There they are. Androids, I hear you cry. And you can get them if you sit on too many committees. What about overproduction? Well, this is the European Jockstrap Mountain, <laughs> sometimes known as St. Michael's Mount. <laughs> Tightening of our hold on underpants should lead to a slackening off in production. Now, <laughs> transport. People have pointed out that due to cuts, the London Scunthorpe motorway only goes as far as my home in Potter's Bar. <laughs> well, who wants to go to Scunthorpe anyway? <laughs> and it will be extended as soon as I move to Royston. <laughs> now, this ticket here is British Rail's new stay away day. How does it work? Well, you travel to a secret destination and we close down the line before you come back. <laughs> the Trans-Siberian Railway is open, of course, so you can still go to the Urals, but not while the train is standing in the station. <laughs> and we'll cut education. Eton and Harrow will come down to half size and merge with Sandwich College. So we'll get a narrow Harrow and a half-eaten sandwich. <laughs> Sport? Well, here's a new government racket. There it is for cheaper doubles. <laughs> Wimbledon will be simplified this year. In the mixed doubles, Joan Collins will play with everyone. <laughs> Danny LaRue will play in the mixed singles. And McEnroe will provide his own ball boy. <laughs> but where do you come in? Well, there are many ways to cut your outgoings. Cut your heating costs by using night storage solar panels. <laughs> yes, that takes a little longer, that one. <laughs> If you have to dial the speaking clock, wait till six and get the cheaper rates. <laughs> and do use these new economical inventions. Here we are, the ultimate oven-ready chicken. <laughs> it has roller skates instead of feet, instant meals on wheels. There we go. <laughs> Our metal-saving scheme here, the metal-saving scheme, there it is. We put holes in all the tins. Here, for example, is a lovely tin of cockaliki soup. <laughs> yes, soup in a basket. <laughs> Plenty of leaky, but very little of anything else. <laughs> and lastly, government. Parliament will be halved and many members cut down to size, including Mr Foote, who will be reduced to six inches. The Liberal Party will be allowed only three seats, which means there'll only be room for Cyril Smith. <laughs> well, there you have it. I myself am going back to Whitehall now, and by tonight I shall be completely cut myself. But who cares? Tell you the truth, I'm half cut already. Good night. <laughs> I say, Humphrey. What is it, Godfrey? You know, no matter how hot the day is, at night it gets dark. <laughs> yes, it's the same in America. Yeah. Just come back, have you? Mm. Did you go for pleasure or did the wife go with you? <laughs> I went to Berne, you know. Very, very grand hotel. Oh, really? Yes, so grand that even the guests have to use the service entrance. <laughs> yeah, that is grand. Funny people, the Americans, you know, very yeah. funny, though. On the plane going over, a woman collapsed. Yeah. Doctor sitting one side of her refused to help. Yeah. Said he was on holiday. Yeah, amazing. Chap sitting the other side of her said, that's disgraceful. Doctor said, would you carry on your profession if you were on holiday? I certainly would, said the other chap. Mm -hmm. All right, what is your profession, he said. I'm a fishmonger, said the other chap. <laughs> and he picked the woman up, loosened her clothing and sold her two pounds if he had her. <laughs> Get off your tiny rod or a lot of shoulda heard their ways. <laughs> now you heard the story of the gory situation of the three blonde marsh. 
Living on the farm in Arizona where the owner was a real mean, mean, married to a farming man. So when you're sitting losing any vision, you are losing. Don't forget those miles. Keep away from all the farmers' wives because some little chalmers might cut off your tail. Three blind mice, three myopic mice. <laughs> See how they run. Oh, call it how they run. They all ran after, after the farmer's wife. She cut, cut off their tails with a carving knife. knife. Certainly ruins the old love life. The sweet <laughs> love. Good evening. Hello. Nice party, isn't it? Yes. I'm a travel agent, actually. I don't know mm. if you've fixed your holidays yet. No? Well, well, perhaps I can offer you one or two rather interesting ideas. No, I... no need, old boy. Too late. I'm a travel agent as well. I'm giving him ideas myself. <laughs> ah, but you see, we rather specialise in unusual methods of travel. For example, go on stilts and wilts or by pogo to togo. <laughs> well, that's nothing. With us, you could scoot into Beirut or you could balloon into Rangoon. <laughs> then at Syracuse, I hire a cruiser and it's hello sailor to Venezuela. <laughs> Perhaps you'd prefer a sort of taxidermy holiday, you know. Embalming things in Palm Springs. Stuff a crow in Buffalo. <laughs> you're, not, you're not actually into taxidermy. No, I probably thought that. You're probably an ordinary broker who likes to do simple things, like shopping. Well, indeed, go shopping with us. Go shopping in Wapping. <laughs> Buy a welly in New Delhi or a hat in Elat. A sandal gay in Mandalay. Or cop an atty kettle and pop a catty pepper. <laughs> Play your bongo in the Congo or rattle your maracas in Caracas. <laughs> Why not try our round-the-world sanitation cruise? If you want to spend a penny, try out. Go to the loo in Peru, sample the ablutions in the illusions. There's a thunderbox in Thunder Rocks, there's a dodgy old Kazi to the east of Benghazi, but in Rock Hall, there's absolutely nothing. <laughs> doesn't want a safari at all, a sanitation safari of that yes. sort. I mean, who does? Perhaps you'd like one of our booze tours. Get Blotto in the Blue Grotto and Canned in the Strand. <laughs> or a Little Tipsy in Poughkeepsie or Plastered in Paris. You're giving me a headache. Oh, you want a medical holiday? Well, fair enough. Go, go to Tulsa for an ulcer or sin for the wind. Yes, if you're blushing, go to Flushing. If you're foaming, try Wyoming. <laughs> for migraine, it's the Ukraine. For sores, the Azores. Ethiopia for myopia and for the fear of lumbago, Tierra del Fuego. And it's off to the Bahamas if you suffer from the farmers. Yes, but for a nasty shock, Bangkok. <laughs> I don't want any of your holidays. I'm a travel agent, too. I'm Nobblers of Twickenham. Oh, Nickers the Twickers. And that's and the as oh. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, the joke I'm going to tell you tonight is not exactly the funniest joke in the world. Now, I'll be honest, you know, this joke is so unfunny, I told it to Stuart Hall of It's a Knockout, <laughs> and he only laughed for one and three-quarter hours. <laughs> <laughs> you were in... We were, in the, we were in the BBC club at the time and things were a bit boisterous. One of Paul Daniel's tricks had got out of hand and there were 73 Nolan sisters at the bar. <laughs> and over in the corner, people were agog with the news that Patrick Moore's suit had just walked into a dry cleaner's and given itself up. <laughs> No, he had some bother, poor old Patrick, because one of the moths in his jacket applied for a home improvement grant. <laughs> and as usual, our producer was feeling a little bit full of himself as he stood there with a pint of Guinness between his legs, trying to get the frock out with a corkscrew. <laughs> this is difficult to say, isn't it? It's not so difficult to laugh at, I hope. <laughs> oh, by the way, I almost forgot at this stage a little wave to my wife, because I sometimes just do this, to be honest, here. she's not been herself just lately. Not since I got her that part-time job as a lollipop lady at Brands Hatch. <laughs> no, let's, let's face it, uh, there have been a few problems at home recently. There was that episode with the settee in the front room. Two weeks ago, a lady came round to recover it, and since then it's been incredibly lumpy. Added to which, we haven't seen my wife's mother for a fortnight. <laughs> so it's very worrying. And on Tuesday, on Tuesday there was an incident when I got up in the middle of the night to fix myself a snack, I went too near the extractor fan and end up sailing through next door's bedroom window. <laughs> so that took the wind out of their sail. <laughs> As a matter of fact, they've been a bit of a nuisance next door, to be honest. They are gadget mad. They have got solar heating panels that are so sensitive that when Terry Wogan smiles on television, the kettle boils. <laughs> and a few weeks ago, they bought this big new water bed with a very powerful electric blanket on top. And at two o'clock every morning, they both start whistling. <laughs> 
added to all that, I've had a lot of worries myself ever since I bought that racehorse from Tesco's. <laughs> now, I know it sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? I mean, how would anybody be so stupid as to buy a racehorse from Tesco's? But I did. I got 5p off because I had a dent in it. <laughs> no, I didn't really buy. I didn't buy a racehorse from Tesco's at all. <laughs> I actually bought a zebra. <laughs> it wasn't my fault. I thought it was a racehorse with a computer pattern on it. <laughs> on to the story. Now, this story this week all takes place on a farm where one day this chap turns up to do a spot of casual work and is given the job of cleaning out the pigsties. And he's, incidentally, if at any point you're dazzled by my fluent grasp of agricultural terms, you know, like pig. <laughs> you may have heard me say the sty, yeah, just like that. I should point out that I did once work in a farm myself. Very small farm, to be honest. We had one sheep. <laughs> and that was 75% polyester. <laughs> As it happened, I only worked on this particular farm for a few weeks. I used to take the cockerel round every night to charge up the battery hens. <laughs> Oh, that's the sort of stuff you like. Yeah, nice. yeah. And it wasn't easy, I can tell you, because the cockerels and the hens had just formed a vigilante group to hunt down Colonel Sanders. <laughs> that was at night time. In the daytime, I was told to go out and cut the corn. Nothing changes, really. <laughs> so, yeah, there's this chap. There's a chap happily hoovering out the pigsties when suddenly he notices that one of the pigs has got a wooden leg. Now, don't ask me which one it was. I can't remember. So, full of curiosity, it doesn't really matter which one it was, one of them had a wooden leg. And since it was only one, it was quite easy to notice and see. <laughs> so he immediately take, talk, he go, he takes the farmer aside. He said, listen. <laughs> I wasn't sure whether he takes or talks. Anyway, he, <laughs> he takes the farmer aside. He, he said, will you excuse me? Excuse me asking this, he said. But I can't help noticing, speaking in a hushed tone, you can't help noticing that that pig has got a wooden leg. Uh, well, you know, why would this be, pray? And the farmer says, well, if it wasn't for that pig, he says, this farm would be, wouldn't be here, he said. A few weeks ago, when I was on my holiday, a fire broke out in that hayloft there. Straight away, the pig smelt the smoke, jumped out of the sty, raced over to the shed, got the house pipe out, connected up to the tap there, and then turned all the water on and put all out all the flames. Then he rang the local fire brigade and came over, cleaned up the mess. And if it hadn't been for that pig, he said the whole place would have gone up in smoke. Chaps, that's absolutely incredible, he said, for a pig to do a thing like that. But why has it got the wooden leg? The farmer says, listen, I'll tell you something else, another thing. That, that pig saved my life, he said. Two weeks ago, I was in town on business. Two muggers cornered me in an alleyway, and they pulled a gun at me. I shout shouts for help, and from five miles away, that pig hears. He jumps out of the sty, he leaps on his bicycle, he cycles all, the way, he cycles all the way into town, then with two swift karate chops from his trotter, he said he fells both the muggers and immediately disarms them. Then seeing me fainting, he gives me the kiss of life, and he carries me on his back to the nearest doctor for assistance. And if it wasn't for that pig, he said, I wouldn't be alive today. So the chap said, well, well he said, that's the most amazing story. He said, I've ever he said but why, why? Has it got a wooden leg? Oh, the farmer says, listen, he said, when well, you've got a pig of that quality, you don't eat it all at once. <laughs> Podmore's End. Never heard of it. You familiar with Podmore's End? Not at all. Mm, lucky Podmore. <laughs> Don't make pathetic jokes, Brian. You haven't the faintest idea where we are, have you? I know exactly where we are, Muriel. We're lost. That's where we are. There's another name up there. I can't see it from here. Well, get out, then. A place called Mile Away. Half a mile away. <laughs> A footpath. Well, at least there may be someone who can tell us where we are. Right, though. You stay? No, I'm not. <laughs> it's far too hot and I'm getting bitten all over with gnats as it is. Probably attracted by your aftershave. Brian! Uh, <laughs> Talking of Freudian slips, mind where you put your feet round about here. Do you think there'll be anywhere where we can spend the night? Well, there's bound to be a pub or an inn or something, you know. Might be quite nice, actually. <laughs> mm. Single bed, mind. What, for the two of us? <laughs> Don't be facetious, Brian. You know how set I am on a single bed? I won't be moved on that. I wouldn't dream of trying to move you on any kind of bed. Yet.
Good day, master, mistress. I do see by your apparel, in shape and form most foreign to mine eye, that you be strangers in this valley and these lands. I give you welcome, master. Oh, thanks awfully. <laughs> by the way, sorry to disturb you in the middle of your carnival day. <laughs> it's just that we were wondering if there was perhaps an inn, you know, where we could spend the night. Single beds, of course. <laughs> well, it be the inn, good master, yonder there. But I must warn you straight. The landlord here, true to his title, landlord, doth possess and is in sooth the lord of all these lands. He is our thane, our duke, our governing peer, and he doth rule, and over all, old sway. Oh, I know the type. Bit of a big head. Mm. Shall I convey thee to my good lord's door? <laughs> yes, certainly. I'll soon sort him out. You're not even in the good food guy. <laughs> Poxy words. If I do but catch thee once again with thy greasy hand inside my money bags, I'll wrap thy legs around thy neck and hang thee up by thy garters for the crows to peck at. Now, be gone. <laughs> what have we here? Tis bold Sir Thomas Thumb, I do declare. Christ welcome, good Sir Tom, and to thy spouse. If such is that she is, such frosty looks dispute she is the mistress of his bed. <laughs> Single beds, Brian. Yes. Uh, good evening. Uh, what I'm wondering is, could you accommodate us for the night um, in, in single beds? Both of us, that is. Separately. In the same room? Yes, but facing different ways. <laughs> what I mean is, can you put us up? What? Put you up? I marry that I shall, my microcosmic lord. Thou shalt be up as tall as any subject in the realm. Thou shalt take dinner, seated on a cask of good red claret, earmarked for the feast. Astride this mount, the tap between thy legs, thou shalt replenish all the serving maids. <laughs> what? Up indeed, the highest in the land, thou shalt dine here with me, on my right hand. Thy frosty spouse, like claret by my crown, should not be up. Nay, she should be laid down. <laughs> That reminds me, Brian. Hot water bottles. Oh, yes, yes. Are the uh, beds warm? There is a wench who, for an honest groat, will warm thy bed with warming pan of coals or whatsoever method you devise twixt her and you. The girl knows all the ways. <laughs> As to this glacier, this Siberian stone, give me its latch key, I will warm it straight. Go, <laughs> oh, enter and prepare ye for the feast. <laughs> Come on, dear. I hope he takes Barclay card. really low, you know. She's got such a big bosom, she can't see the floor. I think I'd like to go to our room now, Brian. I want to listen to Book at Bedtime on Radio 4. It's a bit hectic, isn't it? Mm. Henry VIII's supper's always the same, you know. I've just realised I don't know what room we're in. Well, let's ask him. All right, then. Oh, dear me. <laughs> Excuse me, mine host. Uh, uh, we'd like to retire. So shall you, good Sir Tom. Sweet dreams. Oh, thank you. But stay. 
Before ye go, there's reckoning to be made. Thou must, for this night's work, due recompense in full account of cost be now discharged. This is the custom in these whereabouts. No man shall sleep until he pay his dues. Obviously a union man. <laughs> well, how would you like to be paid, uh, sir? Um, Barclay card or used fivers? What? Papers, bills and promissory notes. Nay, this is not a London counting house. Were not the victuals real? The meat not warm? Was not the wine wet? Did the cheese not bite? How then can we accept some airy pledge, the promise of some future settlement? A shilling in the silver of the realm. The honest coin that bears our good queen's head. A shilling? <laughs> well, why didn't you say? <laughs> it's obviously Arts Council. That's what does Lord Montague's probably behind it. <laughs> there we are, my man. Five feet. Come on, Muriel. This coin is counterfeit. Restrain them. Bear witness all that some strange alien face doth masquerade hereon for good Queen Bess. Elizabeth II, the legend bears, we know, God knows, that there be only one. But look, but me no buts, no scurvy knave. This counterfeiting is a heinous crime. The punishment is clear and widely known. The forfeiture of all thy goods and wealth. And for thy further humblement and shame, to spend the night imprisoned in the stocks. Take him away. Yet hold his wife close by. She, being but a chattel of his house, is likewise forfeit to our royal claim. Go, women, and prepare her for the night with perfumes, unctions. Dress her all in white. White is the ice that floats on Arctic sea. But ice must melt. And melt then. So shall she. <laughs> this would never have happened if we'd stuck to Trust House 40. <laughs> it's going to be freezing cold standing out here all night. At least they might give me something on my head. Sorry, I spoke. You all right? I'm not sure. I think I'm possibly quite well. Why are you doing that, Brian? You look silly. Well, it's the stocks, dear, and I just sat like it. <laughs> You'll have to drive. Did you get much sleep? Not a lot. You know, I just realised that sign isn't there. You know, the one that said, mile away. I don't suppose we dreamt it all, you? My God, what a nightmare. <laughs> Oh, I don't know. All set, Brian, dear. Yes, fine. You seem very, uh, you know, relaxed this morning. Oh, I'm just looking forward to the drive, that's all. <laughs> don't drive too fast, will you? In this position, I might fly away. <laughs> Let's have some music, shall we? Now, listen, you little chickabiddies. With such beautiful weather, you should be out there in the country, not sitting indoors, listening to this kind of rubbish. <laughs> There's places out there you've never even heard of. Believe me, it's worth it. Go and find yourself an adventure. It may change your life. <laughs> Well, that seems to be all we have time for tonight. But before we go, a few late items of news. Special arrangements were made tonight at Lord George Davidson's circus when Boris, the retiring human cannonball, was fired for the last time from the ten-inch howitzer. They shot him straight through the front door of the old folks' home. <laughs> Today also saw the presentation to BBC TV's longest-serving canteen manageress, Imogen Scudamore. She said she wanted something warm and furry, so they gave her the tea urn. <laughs> 
The annual secret service luncheon at the Guild Hall took place today. They all toasted themselves in invisible ink, memorised the menu and ate it. <laughs> but finally, some good news tonight. There's been a marked improvement in the condition of TV star Terry Wogan. He's lost his voice. <laughs> Next week's programme, we'll be demonstrating the new indecent breakfast cereal from Denmark. It's called Porn Flakes. <laughs> when you put the milk on, they go slap, tickle and grope. <laughs> Until then, it's a good night from me. And it's a good night from him. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.